Thank you. Is the sound okay for both of you? Perfect. Yes, okay. it's okay. I'm a little shy, but yes. Let's go. So the title of the presentation is Environmentalist for Nuclear Energy. Um, it's also the title of the book I wrote on the subject and the title of the organization which I created in 1996. Next, uh, Carolina. So we'll be talking about energy and the environment. And of course, nuclear power is uh, one of the solutions for climate change. In fact, it's, it's the main solution for climate change and other problems related to energy. We have a sort of conundrum with two major issues that humanity has to face. There's the availability of energy. We need energy for our civilization. And at the same time, most of this energy today is provided by carbon that we're burning. And we're throwing all that CO2 into the atmosphere and is changing the climate at a global scale. So we'll be talking about that. And uh, then I'll say a few words about EFN, the organization. It's a not-for-profit, um, non-governmental organization, which I created 25 years ago. Next. Uh, there are two types of environmentalists. The old type um, are usually against nuclear power and not considering that there are any benefits at all for nuclear energy. But when you look at it a little closer, then you can see that there are many very good reasons, as we will see, to be in favor of nuclear energy because there are many benefits for the environment and also for health. Now the entire presentation can run uh, over an hour and a half, so I'll make it short on the health benefits and we will more concentrate on the environmental benefits for energy production today. Next. Let me say a few words so that you understand where I come from. On the top left here, you can see my father, who was an exploration geologist searching for oil. So I grew up in close contact with nature. On the top right, you can see me in the arms of my mother when I was uh, one and two years old uh, in the jungle in Gabon, where my father was searching for oil then. I lived three years. It was my first three years of life, eating bananas and, and going on pyrogues like this in, in the jungle, living naked on the beach. So that was sort of my first steps as an environmentalist. Then I did my military service on a French Navy um, ship, which you can see in the middle left. And uh, this took me to the Persian Gulf. I was a deck officer. And our mission was to keep the oil flowing through the Hormuz Strait when there were, uh, Iran was threatening to block the strait and <clears throat> stop the flow of oil for uh, Western countries. So I had several occasions to think about what is war, what is our society, and how oil is like the blood in our veins for the modern world today. Um, on the bottom right, you can see my house, where I'm speaking from right now. It's an echo house, so we'll say a few words about that which is uh, in the western, close western suburbs of Paris, so you're welcome to drop in if you ever travel to Paris. I know your house, yes. He, he organized a lot of picnic, uh, and uh, here is a house exactly ecologic. Uh, we, we did a tour, exactly, he showed for us, and it's amazing, yes. You can explain more if you want. Yeah, I'll say a few words about that. You're welcome to drop in if you want to come for Christmas. There's an event on a Christmas lunch and afternoon party on the 25th of December, so you're both welcome. Um, and then in the bottom middle, you can see me with my good friend Patrick Moore, who was a co-founder of Greenpeace in 1971. And he was the international director for Greenpeace during 15 years. So he sort of grew the organization from uh, almost nothing to what it became. Uh, he's pro-nuclear and uh, he's the honorary president of EFN in Canada. Good friend. Next. Now, as a professionally and as a student, I first studied mathematics, physics, and nuclear science, Ecole Polytechnique in France, which is sort of high level science, and uh, Ecole Nationale Supérieure de Technique Avancée uh, to become a nuclear physicist. So now I live in my echo house in Uy, which is a passive house, positive energy, and with integral recycling. Uh, you can see on the bottom left the solar panels on my roof up upstairs. 
and there's also a small windmill in front of the house. Uh, of course, it's heated by a heat pump and uh, the geothermal heating will say a few words about all that a little later. Next. So my military service took me to the Persian Gulf, which is uh, uh, where I served as a deck officer in the French Navy. Our mission was to protect the <clears throat> super tankers navigating through the Hormuz Strait. This was at the time of the Iran-Iraq War in 1981. And I learned there how fragile our oil supplies can be. Next. I could have made a brilliant career in the French administration or the industry, but in the early 1980s, I decided to devote my life to writing books about better health and better environment. So this of course radically changed the orientation of my life. I had no clue I would ever create a nuclear organization a little later. But I then traveled around the world to speak about better nutrition, eating organic foods, being a raw foodist, or relaxation. I have a book about ultra rapid sleep. I've been teaching yoga in addition to relaxation and uh, various health, natural health subjects in general. Next. This is a view of our planet seen from outer space at night. Of course. Sorry, you can open your micro, Bruno, <laughs> because I close to everybody. Open your micro, Bruno. Bruno? Hello. I'm back. Yeah. Sorry, I closed for you. Uh, so this is a reconstructed image showing the entire planet at night and the bright spots indicate the level of energy consumption. So you can see it's basically the United States, Europe, India, and China are the most brilliant spots. Uh, today, 20% of the world's population consumes 60% of the energy, and you can see that Africa and South America are not as brilliant, uh, not as bright. Now, the poorer regions like Africa are almost completely in the dark and still need to uh, open themselves to more energy consumption. Next. The world population has increased since 1850 by a factor of four. And it's expected to continue to rise, perhaps stabilize around 2050 to something like 10 billion inhabitants. Um, this also contributes to a sharp rise in energy consumption. So there's a double phenomenon increasing the energy need for humanity. First, there are more humans. And second, each human requires more and more energy as time goes by. So this also has polluting effects and uh, possibly devastating effects for the climate and the atmosphere. Next. On this chart, we can see that the world energy consumption has considerably grown in the past 150 years, and especially so in the past 50 years. In the next half century, uh, consumption can be expected to again increase with sharp rises in the developing countries at the same time as we need to decrease our oil, gas, and coal energy consumption. So as an environmentalist, I'm greatly worried about the consequences for our lifestyle and our climate if we do that uh, in the business as usual scenario and we continue burning coal. Continue, next. Uh, humanity produces its energy today with about 7% hydro, 7% nuclear, and 85% carbon, which generates 3 million tons every hour of carbon dioxide dumped directly into the atmosphere as a garbage can. It's 800 tons every second. Just since I started this presentation a few minutes ago, mankind has added another 500,000 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And the total of wind, geothermal, and solar is only a few percent, about 2%. Now it's increased since I did this, uh, prepared this slide. So it's about 2% of the world energy production globally. Next. Now, our main energy supply is coal, oil, and gas. Here you can see the flow of uh, oil from the producing countries to the consuming countries. And the arrows are as wide as the uh, intensity of the energy flow. You can see that uh, there's a highly sensitive area that is the Persian Gulf, which is the main 
area in the world which is producing the country for the Western world and the world in general. Until now, the Hormuz Strait has been spared, being blocked by terrorism and the obvious destructive acts that you can easily imagine and that I was supposed to prevent on that French Navy ship in the 1980s. The situation hasn't really changed since, except that the terrorists haven't yet dared to block the strait. It's pretty easy to do, just put a few mines in there, blow up the super tankers. The reason they didn't dare that it would probably trigger an important war which might destroy them completely. But uh, they, there, were, there were and there still are important threats that this Hormuz Strait be blocked. And uh, if this was the case, it would be a major disruption for a civilization much greater than the World Trade Center terrorist acts, for example. Next. Again. Okay, here you can see the evolution of the price of oil with the first oil shock in the 1973. You can see the second oil shock in the 1980. That's when I was on zone, war zone in Hormuz Strait. And um, then there's been a third oil shock in, in two, around 2005. And now we're facing an oil shock again uh, for different nature post COVID uh, where oil is becoming scarce again while the need is um, being increased. And this creates against, again, a new shock with the price. However, the problem in the future is not really about the price of oil but about the availability of oil. It's a finite resource. We're not reaching, and we've been past already what is called the oil production peak, which means that at some point we will not be able to produce enough oil and gas to continue to satisfy the need. So in the coming years, entire portions of the planet will be simply deprived from oil and gas. As the production declines in some countries, in the main countries, and while the demand continues to rise, so great tensions will then appear because it's like the blood in our veins and people will react, the countries will react and probably unpleasant things will happen then. So now we're in a sh oil shock again, but it's only about the price for the moment at least. But we can see that with other materials, it's not only about the price, it's the availability. So many factories in the world right now are halted because they don't have the microchips. And uh, if you halt the production of oil, you halt not only some uh, companies and factories, you just halt the entire world economy. Everything stops. Energy is at the basis of absolutely everything. Transportation of our food, it runs all the factories, it, it will light us, keep us warm, keep the computers working. It's at the basis of absolutely everything. So it's, it's speaking about energy, is not like speaking about health or speaking about microchips or speaking about cars. It, it, it's behind absolutely everything. Next. Here you can see the um, oil depletion rate of different countries. This is a few years old, but you can see that on average, the main OPEP oil producing countries are more than half depleted now, the big ones like Iraq, um, Kuwait, and all the major resources of oil have um, pumped out half or less than half or more than half, depending on the case, uh, of the oil that they have available in the ground. So this means that in the future, it, as oil becomes scarce, even greater tensions will appear. Next. Now, all these tons of oil we take from under the earth, we are throwing them out into the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide, which is the main contributor to global warming. Next. The greenhouse gas effect is the biggest environmental challenge we have to face today. Our planet is warming up. In the 20th century, it's been warming about 0 0.5 degree. Uh, up to today, we're about 0 0.7 degrees. It seems like it's not a big change, but um, the projections for the 21st century show that it might heat up by something like two or three to six degrees Celsius. Now that's a pretty big change. 
And uh, so if we stopped emitting greenhouse gases just entirely right now, because if we could, which of course isn't the case, it's absolutely impossible, then the planet would continue to warm up for at least two centuries. It means there's a long uh, hysteresis effect. It will go on even if we stop. Because of the CO2 we have already poured out into the atmosphere. Only half of the carbon dioxide that is thrown out into the atmosphere is actually reabsorbed by the ecosystems like the trees, the plants, and the algae in the sea, which will redigest this CO2 and redeposit it in the bottom of the sea or transform it into oxygen again. So half of the everything we're pouring out into the atmosphere is just accumulating in the atmosphere. This gives an increase of about three ppm of carbon dioxide every year. It's going up. So just a few years ago, it was in the 300 ppms. Now we're in the 400 ppms, and it's increasing ever faster. Continue next. What do you think about this question? Yeah, maybe we can keep this question for later. We stop emitting greenhouse gases today, or what's happened with? Maybe we can keep this question maybe for. Yeah, I suggest we keep most of the questions for the end. Otherwise, it might be a lot longer than expected. Okay. There's a. I have 60 uh, slides, so we'll go pretty fast on some of them, but some of them, like this one, needs a little explanation. Uh, yes. So the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere has been increasing in the 18th century. It was in the 200 ppms. Now we're above 400 ppm, and uh, it might. The more we put CO2 into the atmosphere, the more it goes up. So the IPCC uh, recently confirmed that first it's getting worse, and second it's due to the human activities and the oil we're burning, oil and gas and coal. So for the first time in history, mankind is significantly changing the composition of our, the atmosphere, which means it's a global change in our environment. We are burning in just 50 years the oil reserves that nature has taken 100 million years to fabricate. If we want today's oil production to be sustainable, it means we need about 2 million planets like the Earth. The top priority is to urgently stop burning all that oil, gas, and coal, which is not only throwing out CO2 into the atmosphere, it's also putting particulate, a small fine particulate pollution um, dust into the atmosphere, as we saw in that short TV interview just before the presentation. And um, it's also pouring out sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides. So sulfur oxides gives the acid rains and nitrogen oxides gives the respiratory disease, especially in the city. Next. Here you can see how quickly the polar ice cap is melting. The top left picture was taken in 1979, and the bottom left photo was taken in 2003. Again, this is a reconstructed image, of course, because there, there usually are clouds at least somewhere on the planet. Um, so you can see how quickly the ice cap is melting. It's more than half of the um, uh, épaisseur, uh, depth of the ice cap uh, has been resorbed and almost half of the surface. Uh, so this provides a change on what you call the albedo, which means that the sun rays coming down on the earth uh, will be reflected by the ice cap. But if the ice cap becomes black or seawater, then it's absorbed instead of being reflected, which again can change the balance of the heat balance of, the, of our planet. On the top right photo, you can uh, diagram, you can see the yellow color, which represents the area of scrubs and deserts today. And on the bottom right photo, it's what the deserts and scrubs will become if the climate heats up by five degrees Celsius, which means there'll be more than double the surface than there are today. And large portions of uh, almost the entirety of Africa and Southern Asia, Australia will become scrubs and deserts, much of South America as well. And so it might make life a little better in the north of Siberia, but you can imagine the um, exodus which this will create and the disruption for humanity. Now, all this is it's expected to happen or might happen before the end of the 21st century. So it will be a major challenge and change. Next. Here you can see uh, 
the major contributors to the greenhouse, if, greenhouse effects. So on the left, you have coal, oil, and gas, which are the three great contributors. Of course, uh, gas is a little cleaner than coal, than oil, and oil is a little better than coal. But 20% less than a lot is still a huge amount. So on the right, you have the uh, good energies, quote, uh, which it put out into the atmosphere much uh, lesser amounts of carbon dioxide. Now there you have the intermittent renewables like wind, solar, you have hydro, and you have nuclear. So those are the energies we should be going for. Only nuclear energy, however, is uh, both abundant, cheap enough, not intermittent to satisfy the need, and can require, can satisfy the needs and requirements of our modern societies. Next. So the question is, what can we do? So obviously in a world where energy might be running short, energy conservation is a priority and energy efficiency can also contribute. Now the difference is energy conservation is when you don't use the energy anymore, you just use less. And energy efficiency means you satisfy the same need, but with, with an apparatus which is more efficient. For example, when you use LED lights, uh, they will consume about five times less energy to provide the same, provide the same amount of light in, in your office. So that's energy efficiency. Then the third point is that we should produce energy in a clean manner. Now, when you um, just think at a global scale, we need to at least reduce the amount of carbon that we throw into the atmosphere by a factor two. Uh, and as the developing countries need more than they have today, it means that in the modern developed countries like the United States and Europe, we have to um, lower our energy consumption, our carbon emissions by at least the factor four. So that's where the factor four is coming from. Next. Okay, so this is a picture of my house. A well-built echo house requires much less energy. Mine is about 20 times less than a normal home. And if it's located in France, which produces most of its electricity by nuclear energy, and uh, the house isn't connected to gas, doesn't require any gas, it consumes only a very small amount of electricity, then such a home is as comfortable, in fact, it's more comfortable than a standard home, it doesn't cost really much more to build, and it, it puts out 400 times less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Next. So one ecological technique, for example, which is installed in my house, or I would say in my garden, you can see the, the pipes, which are the diagram with the pipes. Uh, it's a 20 centimeter diameter pipe, which is uh, under my garden. And all the air that comes into the house circulates in that pipe. So it's centralized ventilation. And uh, the air is simply cooled down in summer to a cooler temperature because two meters underground, you always have the same stable temperature of 14 degrees. That's in France. It depends on the latitude of where you live, of course. But in France, it's 14 degrees Celsius. So that's very close to the 20 degrees you want in the home. So when it's very hot, like 35 degrees Celsius in summer, you can cool down the air to 14 degrees, you get free air conditioning. The whole system will consume only 30 watts with a ventilator, vent a small ventilation system to pull the air in. Uh, but you don't need to cool down the air, the earth will do that for you. And in winter, when it's minus 10 or minus 20 outside in a very cold winter, then the air will be heated up to 14 degrees before it enters the house. So it, it it gives a free geothermal air conditioning. So that's the example of one system. Next. But there are lots of things you can do for better echo construction. For example, uh, better insulation. Um, my home is passive home. It has thicker insulation, better insulation. It's com almost completely airtight. And um, uh, bioclimatic design, thermal control, better control automation, which means that you have, there's nothing you have to do. The home always remains in the optimal parameters for the comfort as you decide. You can program the air, the temperature you want, the humidity you want, moisture you want. And um, all this is uh, automatic. So it's not like an earth ship. They you know they have earth ships in the US where you have to open and close things manually all the time. 
And, uh, but this house is a echo house, uh, modern, and with lots of automation pipes and electronics. So it's top comfort uh, and also top efficiency, in fact. So this divides the energy need by a factor of about 20 and the emissions by a factor of several hundreds by com combining these different technologies. On the bottom left, you can see my heat pump. Then the second photo uh, on the, from the left is uh, uh, the double flux ventilation. So all the air comes into that from the underground, circulates under the garden, then come in, comes in, goes through that heat exchanger, which is the square white box. Um, and then it's uh, injected into the different rooms in the house. So this is not a dream. This, such houses exist, and I've been experimenting living, building in that house and living inside, and it's uh, very happy with it. And it requires very little energy. It's uh, several uh, hundred square meters, so lots of comfort. And uh, the energy cost is uh, about one euro per day over the entire year, so something like 400 euros per year for uh, air conditioning, uh, electricity, uh, heating in winter, ventilation, uh, cooking, uh, lighting, and also my professional uh, energy consumptions. And then you can add another uh, about three, about the same 3000 kilowatt hours um, per year for the electric car, which is parked in front of the door. Next. Our, our own choices and the lifestyle we have, of course, also makes a huge difference. Uh, we can produce and consume in different manners. Uh, we can uh, have better transportation, doesn't have to be less. If it's electric and if you live in France where nuclear is 95% clean, then uh, you're not emitting carbon. Tra my transportation has been carbon. The house was built between 2007 and 2010. So I've been uh, zero CO2 house basically for about 15 years now. And um, I've been totally carbon free, including transportation since 2012, so almost 10 years now. So basically I've become what I call a, a carbon free citizen, which means I don't need to burn carbon or only very small amounts, like for my, maybe the clothes, uh, maybe for bringing the food, the trucks that might bring the food, but th those are rather small amounts comparing the big uh, energy uh, pollution comes from heating the buildings and driving your cars, transportation. So we can all act. Uh, I've also been a raw foodist for a long time. Now I do some steam cooking sometimes. Uh, since I got married, I had to negotiate about the cooking habits. Uh, but basically I'm pretty much invested into having a more efficient lifestyle in general. It's not only about energy and what the government does. It's also basically about what you do for yourself. When you look at the numbers, the government could do a few things for you. But basically, when you look at, for example, the Kyoto uh, meeting in the 1990s, uh, the big goal was to reduce your carbon emissions by something like 20% over a period of 20 years. Now, that's clearly not enough for the challenge we're facing. When you take it at a political level, it's the best you can do. And most countries are not even successful in doing that. When you look at, at it from the individual level, that's where all the power is. That's where we can act. I've decided to change and become carbon free in 2000, basically 2005. It took me two, two years to organize my new house then uh, two years to build the new house. And uh, then I decided to buy an electric car when the first uh, efficient cars came out. It was a Renault Zoe in 2012 and uh, basically uh, and new house and the new car and working at home does it all. So I've been carbon free citizen for almost 10 years. Next. Transportation is uh, uh, an important part of it. Basically becoming carbon free is a three step uh, story. It's pretty much like dancing rock and roll. Dancing rock and roll is a three step tempo. Three, three rhythm, triple rhythm. The first step to become carbon free is you have to produce electricity in a clean manner. That's the national program. Like France did in the first oil shock, 1973, big priority French nuclear program. So that's step number one. Only France has does, done this properly so far. 
but it's like an example for the rest of the world. That's step number one. Step number two is the buildings. So we can each act for our own home. And step number three is uh, transportation. And there we can also, each of us can act, either take more public transportation like electric trains or buy an electric car. So that is something that's possible now. So there's three steps like rock and roll, stop burning fossil fuels, produce energy cleanly, electrify everything and produce the electricity in a clean manner. Next. Next again. Okay, this is just to show you the progress with electric car batteries. Uh, in, the, in the 20th century until the 1990s, basically we only had lead batteries. Then we started having the nickel cadmium uh, nickel batteries, then uh, arrived the lithium ion, which are the current batteries. Then we have the solid state batteries arriving in new technologies. Uh, but you can see that each time we have this new technology, it's more efficient than the previous technology. And uh, so the uh, batteries we have today are about basically five times better than the ones we had just 15 or 20 years ago. And the, the power of batteries for the same weight and the same volume doubles every five years. It's like the Moore's law, it's an exponential. Of course, they won't go on forever. But I, when I bought my first electric car in 2012, it had a 22 kilowatt hour battery, a Renault Zoe. Then in 2017, Renault issued uh, the new Renault Zoe 2017 model. It was exactly the same car, just the battery was different. It was a 41 kilowatt hour, which means double the amount. So between 2012 and 2017 times two. And this progression has been going on since. My new electric car now I changed. I'm not with the Renault Zoe anymore. I have a Hyundai Kona, it's a South Korean car. And the battery is now 64 kilowatt hours, but the Teslas have 100 kilowatt hour batteries and new cars are now arriving with 150 kilowatt hour batteries. So we can see that this, there's a progression and there are new batteries at, at research level and development level, which are better than the ones we have today. like the new uh, Tesla cells, which uh, Elon Musk has announced about a year or two ago, and which will be in the, in the new Tesla Roadster and the new Tesla cars. So they're about like 20% more efficient. So this progression is going on, which means that the change from oil to um, electric cars is pretty much guaranteed now. We have the batteries that are either available or coming up very soon. So I've been driving 100% electric uh, since 10 years. And I off, my usual trip is I go to Southern France, which is about 700 kilometers. But I've done trips up to 2,500 kilometers, no problem. It just takes a few hours more, but not that much. And it costs a lot less and the car is a lot much more comfortable and pleasant to drive. Next. Another thing we can do is to, uh, for heat production is nuclear cogeneration. Until now, nuclear reactors are producing electricity, but the heat is thrown out into the atmosphere or into the rivers. And two thirds of the energy is wasted in a sense. So we can also do cogeneration, which means we fabricate electricity as we're doing with the reactors now. But instead of wasting the heat, we will put this heat uh, for good use, like heating up cities. So on the Bottom right of this picture, you can see plants that were made in the 1970s in France to heat up the city of Grenoble. Uh, that was at the moment of the first uh, oil shock. And you just install a small reactor like 200 megawatts near the city of Grenoble, and it produces heat for the entire city, even if it has like 500,000 or a million inhabitants, not a problem. Um, such a reactor has been built, for example, uh, in Sweden. And then it was stopped a few years later because the price of oil went down. And so they decided it was not profitable again. But as the price of oil today is going up, we can see that there's a resurgence and a comeback of all the small reactor concepts, which are very much in the news these days. And uh, these are very good reactors to basically to replace the small coal plants. Very often there, they can be in the 200 to 500 megawatt zone. And uh, you can also recover large amounts of heat to heat up the cities. Next, so that's what you call nuclear cogeneration. There's a few nuclear uh, reactors, in fact, in the world who do this already. 
Like uh, I visited the reactor at Timmerin in the Czech Republic who does some co-generation. So they heat the local city with the heat from the reactor. And uh, same uh, for with the uh, Kalinin uh, nuclear power plant in Russia, which is uh, about a two hour drive from Moscow. And so I visited that and they, they also heat the Kaliningrad, which is a nearby city. Next. So basically we should ban carbon from electricity production and from our lifestyle in general. That leaves us with two main sources of energy, the renewables, the main of which is not the sun and uh, the wind, but it's water, hydro, and uh, which is the main source of hydro, uh, of the renewable energy today. And uh, solar and wind can add a little bit, but unfortunately they're intermittent. And of course we have nuclear power. So let's look at these two a little closer. Next. Here you can see the modern windmills. They can be about up to 200 meters high. They're not small windmills that you put in, in the backyard or in your front yard like I have in front of my house. Those windmills might produce a few hundred watts, but they just can't even power your home. Uh, these are industrial windmills, which are twice as high or three times as high as the Cathedral of Paris, which I, of course, it's a photomontage on this picture, just to show you the difference in the size. So they're basically damaging the environment quite a bit because of their size and because of the numbers you have to install. To produce as much energy as an EPR reactor, which France is building on the coast of Normandy and has built two in China, uh, you have to install uh, 2,400 of these huge uh, windmills, for example, all along the Mediterranean coast, all 800 kilometers long, all the way from Genoa in Italy to Barcelona in Spain. And that would replace just one nuclear reactor, which is uh, smaller than the size of this cathedral, in fact. So it's tens of thousands of windmills against just a few reactors. Uh, from an environmental point of view, I prefer having just one or a very small number of building producing large amounts of electricity. Next. So wind energy can help, but unfortunately it will not save the planet. And now the main reason is that it is intermittent and 80% uh, of the time, the efficiency is about 20% onshore. It goes up to maybe 30% if you put them in the ocean, but the problem is then that the price, which is already very high, goes up by another factor three or four when you put them offshore. Uh, so it's just not competitive in that case. So it works with uh, very high levels of uh, financial support taken from tax money. But if you want to replace all the energy we're consuming with this, our entire economy just gets broke immediately. In addition to the fact that you can cut off the energy supply two thirds of the time. So this can help to a very small extent, but it's dilute and available only when the wind blows. In my opinion, wind energy can be developed but it only a small independent windmills. If private people want to put that in their front yard, like I do or in the backyard or in a farm, it's perfect. But uh, as in a society, as a group, as a modern economy, it just will never satisfy the needs of our society. Next. Most people think that countries who have the greatest proportion of windmills are the cleanest. This is simply not true. Here you can see the number of uh, European countries. On the left of the chart, it's the CO2 emissions um, in, per country, for each country, per gigawatt hour produced. On the left, you can see the clean countries, which are Sweden and France. There's also Switzerland in that category. Um, because the Sweden and France both produce 90, over 90 percent of their energy with uh, nuclear and hydro and in fact a very small amount only with windmills and solar power because you don't need it when you have enough hydro and nuclear. Then on the right hand side you can see Denmark and Germany which are constantly shown as examples on television but are absolutely not the examples you can you should follow because they are the highest emitters. You can see their electricity is in fact very dirty. It's about more than 10 times per gigawatt hour, the amount that we have in France and Sweden. So the example to follow is not Germany, it's not Denmark, it is Sweden and France. Next. 
Solar energy can also help, but only when the sun shines. Uh, you can see those solar panels on my rooftop. Uh, their production is not negligible. They've been installed in 2010 and uh, they produce about 3000 kilowatt hours per year, which is exactly the amount that I'm consuming with my house and uh, my family, I live with my son. Um, so my production is 3000 kilowatt hours and my consumption is 3000 kilowatt hours. However, I'm still connected and very happy to be connected to the French nuclear grid because my production is not at the moment I need it. I've installed a small 10 kilowatt hour battery, but you can, there's no way you can store the electricity produced in summer when the wind is the strongest, when the sun shines uh, and consume it in the winter when I need it for the heating of my home and to feed my heat pump. So even when you have a electric uh, uh, solar panels on the roof and the Tesla battery or a equivalent system 10 kilowatt hours like I have, there's absolutely no way you can be uh, autonomous and produce your own energy and have a modern lifestyle in a modern house and take hot showers every day morning, have a washing machine and so on. So the only way to do that is to have an electric grid, distribute the electricity and produce it with a factory that produces large amounts and produces that amount exactly when you need it. So solar and wind simply don't match the need. Next. Uh, nuclear energy is growing worldwide. Of course, France is constructing the new EPR reactor. Uh, they have plans in the UK, Russia, India, China, uh, Poland. So there are a number of countries which are continuing to build more nuclear. And uh, of course, the case of Germany and Denmark is like a epiphenomenon where they are still thinking they will go out of nuclear energy easily. But you can notice that until today, Germany has been uh, talking and talking about moving out of nuclear energy, but they still have those nuclear power plants producing the electricity. They only close a few of their reactors. They're not closed yet. So they're due to close the last reactors in 2022, but then there will be a sort of conundrum. How do they, how do they produce their electricity? So they've built a number of gas plants, in, including one on the Rhine River, uh, and they've built exactly the same number of 1000 megawatt gas plants as they've been shutting nuclear power plants. So basically, it's just pure political hypocrisy. So my advice is never believe a politician that makes a promise to be held in 20 or 50 years. If he says it's in 20 years, it means it's not possible. And uh, be careful about uh, what he'll be doing instead. So Germany, political hypocrisy. Next. Here's a comparison of the German and French situation. The example to be followed is clearly France. The CO2 emissions in France are about five tons. The CO2 emissions in Germany are about 10 tons. That's per year and per inhabitant. So French citizens emit two times less carbon dioxide into the energy than Germany. So our German friends should stop bragging about their good example and just follow the example of France. In fact, when their windmills don't produce the energy they need, they need, they are very happy to import large amounts from the French nuclear power plants. And then there's also the cost of electricity. We're running in after post COVID into big financial crisis now. And the cost of electricity is also important. And the cost of electricity in Germany, this, is a, this slide is not up to date. Now it's over 30 cents per kilowatt hour in Germany. And in France, it's increased because of those windmills that we're building and the subvention for the solar photovoltaic panels. It's already gone up in France from 12 to 20 cents per kilowatt hours. But in Germany, it's almost double the amount. And in Denmark, it's even worse. It's almost 40 cents per kilowatt hour. So the more windmills and uh, solar you install, the, the more expensive your electricity becomes. And um, uh, the more you pollute because uh, to uh, for the 80% of the time when the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing, it's easier and cheaper to install a gas plant. It's cheaper in the, in the short term. In fact, it's a lot more expensive than nuclear in the long term, but politicians don't only see the two or three first year until the next term, of course. So uh, the example to be followed is France. Next. 
So as an environmentalist, of course, I'm in favor of energy conservation, energy efficiency, more efficient homes, electric cars, more efficient cars, and so on. But at the same time, we need to continue to power our modern civilization. And to do that, well, we don't have much choice in a world where, where energy will be running short. We need all energies that we can have that are clean. And there's only two renewables, which unfortunately can only produce small amounts and not when we need it, and nuclear, which uh, should be the solution. Uh, we've been living in the era of oil in the 20, second half of the 20th century, and uh, now is starting the era of nuclear. It's a new moment um, in history. Sorry, there's a problem with the image there. So nuclear energy, next. Let's talk more about the benefits and what is nuclear energy. There are many benefits. First, a nuclear power plant is quite compact. Such a power plant uh, can produce up to 1600 megawatts of power. That's the French uh, EPR, which is operating now, uh, two units in China and uh, two units being built in Europe. Um, 1600 megawatts is the most powerful energy power plant that's been, ever been made by humanity. Then the, the amount of um, fuel that you need to put inside is very small. Just um, uh, to run these power plants, you need basically 20 tons, which is about one or two cubic meters of uranium fuel per year, just to operate that power plant for an entire year, which can power big cities of millions of inhabitants. If you do that with coal, you need uh, hundreds of kilometer long trains of coal every day. So you replace this by just a small van of uranium every year. So it's not a small reduction. The, what makes nuclear energy so unique is what I call the factor one million. One gram of uranium produces as much energy as one ton of oil. Now one gram is very small and one ton is a big amount. Factor one million is a huge difference. The best energy is the energy that requires no material at all and produces no waste at all. Of course, nuclear energy still requires a very small amount of uranium fuel, but the amount is so small that it's very clearly the closest we have to zero. Nothing is absolutely zero, but the nuclear energy is the closest you can come to zero. When you do the life cycle analysis of every type of energy, Nuclear energy is even better than solar of wind because to just for those giant windmills, you need about a thousand tons of concrete at the bottom of the windmill, just in the earth. And then you need hundreds of tons of steel just to erect the windmill. And you need uh, hundreds of kilos of precious metals to operate that windmill. Now, when you compute all that into make your calculations, you can see that nuclear energy is about 10 times better then solar and wind for the rare earth and uh, special metals and various materials, and even for the amount of concrete that you need for the plant. So ecologically, in fact, nuclear power is just superior to every other energy we have, in, in addition to the fact that it's the only one that can really fit the need. Next. The amount of waste that is produced is accordingly in small proportions as well. When you consume a million times less material, you produce a million times less waste for a simple reason is that the waste is only the raw material that has been transformed. So there are tiny amounts of nuclear waste. The volume is very small. Uh, this waste, because there's a very small volume, it's not rejected into the environment. Therefore, the ecological impact the pollution is absolutely nil, it's just zero. Because so small amounts are produced, they are not put back into the biosphere. And they are kept away from the biosphere until they decay and they're not toxic anymore. So th these wastes are very well managed and in normal operation, absolutely nothing goes out. Nuclear waste is almost perfectly isolated from the biosphere. Of course, nothing is absolutely perfect. So there are tiny amounts of radioactivity going out of the nuclear power plant, but the amounts are so tiny is that, as we will see on the next slides, it's much less than the amount of radiation that's everywhere around us in nature. Next. 
Uh, also, nuclear waste is reprocessed. It can be reprocessed, and it is in France. It's been for several decades now. When the used nuclear fuel is taken out of the reactor, it is separated into three uh, components. First, the unused uranium, which is still 96% of the used nuclear fuel. So this is uh, separated and recycled. Then there's 1% of plutonium that has been produced. This plutonium, uh, when it's uh, pressurized and boiling water reactors, which are the reactors used for electricity production today, it's not of military quality, which means you cannot make efficient bombs with that plutonium. And 3% only of the used nuclear fuel is a, what you call the fission products, which is basically waste. So these waste are separated at the La Hague nuclear uh, reprocessing plant. And uh, the waste is vitrified, which means it's made completely inert, and it will be stored somewhere underground where it doesn't do any harm to the rocks and the geological formations. The volume of waste produced by a typical French family, as you can see on the right-hand side, of course, I don't recommend you hold the waste in your hand in this manner. It's just to show the volume is about a, a hockey puck or a golf ball for an entire lifetime of a French family. Next, that's after reprocessing. Of course, if the waste is not reprocessed, then the volume is much larger. Thank you. Uh, uh, radioactivity is everywhere around us in nature. In fact, here in Paris, where I'm speaking from, in the underground, there's uh, several uh, tons of uranium right under my house in the first 100 meter of soil, there's several tons of uranium. And that's the case everywhere on the planet. It's only three parts per million, but when you make the calculation, you have tons of tons under your garden. So uranium is absolutely everywhere. Of course, in some areas, there's a lot more than others. And there's also thorium, which is radioactive in nature. So uh, natural radiation varies a lot. That's another important thing to understand. So in Paris, natural radiation will be about 0.1 microsievert per hour. But in some places, for example, in an airplane, when I fly up to the United States or Japan in, in the upper atmosphere, you have about five microsieverts per hour, which is about 50 times more than at the sea level. Every time you go up 2,000 meters, no, every 1,000 meter, you double the amount of radiation, basically. So, uh, I traveled to Guarapari in Brazil and studied natural radiation there. So you can see that beach on the left-hand side picture. Uh, the black sand, which you can see on the photo, is uh, thorium rich. Now it varies really a lot. That, thor that sand on that beach, I measured up to 50 microsieverts per hour, which is 10 times more than in the airplanes and 500 times more than here in my echo house in the suburbs of Paris or any other place on the planet. The city of Guarapari, in fact, is famous for its beneficial health effects. You can see the, the uh, flyer of the Office of Tourism of Guarapari on the top left. It says Guarapari uh, Cidade da Saúde in Portuguese. That means Guarapari City of Health. So it's a city that's famous for its beneficial health effects. And the Amazonian Indians, the natives, would come on that beach uh, even before radiation was discovered by uh, uh, Antoine Becquerel in, at the end of the 19th century, the Amazonian Indians would come there to uh, cure all sorts of diseases that they have. So this is what you call hormesis or the beneficial health effects of radiation. We need radiation just like we need the sun rays and the sunlight. Of course, we need a certain amount of radiation, more than we usually have in nature, but uh, uh, not up to the point where it becomes harmful at very high doses. So there's a beneficial zone. Then when you go higher, there's a, a danger zone. So radio protection, of course, is important. I'm not saying that you should go and take a, a bath of radiation in a nuclear power plant in operation. That would be deadly. But if you go on a radioactive beach like Guarapari, which is just a about 500 times more than normal natural radiation, which is quite a difference already, uh, then it's beneficial for your health. People come from all over South America and sometimes even other parts of the world to that beach just to take a bath of radiation because it improves your immune system. It cures uh, um, rheumatism and uh, various types of inflammation. So 
that's interesting and not always very well known. Uh, I've also visited uh, Ramsa, which is an interesting place because it's the hottest spot in nature. So I've long been searching for that. And I went there in 2006. So next picture. Next, thank you. So th that, these photos were taken in Ramsa, where there's this, a village, uh, a small city, and uh, there's these small rivulets are flowing through the city. You can see on the top right, and I'm taking a sample of the water there to get it analyzed in France after I flew back. So the, this water is slightly radioactive, and in this case, it's not thorium. It's not uranium like in Paris. It's not thor, thorium or thoron, which is a radioactive descendant of thorium, like in Grand Paris. In this case, it's radium, which is coming from the inside of the earth and comes through those, this water in the small rivulets. And the radium will precipitate because there's a change in the temperature of the water as it cools down, the radium precipitates. And then much of the houses inside the village have been built with a radium, uh, radium concentrated uh, uh, cement. And, and so these are the most radioactive homes or houses on the planet. And, and for example, on the bottom right, you can see me with uh, Mr. Tarishi which is an interesting guy because he's the guy who has been most exposed to radiation in the entire history of humanity. He lives in a house with 150 microsieverts per hour. I measured that inside his kitchen and there were 50 microsieverts per hour in his bedroom. So these are levels of radiation. If you have them in a nuclear power plant, you're supposed to run out immediately. But he's been living in, in that radiation and when I met him in 2006, he was already 10 years above the average lifespan in his country, Iran. So this is the highest radiation in the world. And on the top right photo, you can see the buildings in the back there. That's a primary school which has been abandoned. But it, it used to be a primary school and Monsieur Tarashi was the principal of the school, which means that he was living in the most radioactive house in the world and teaching professionally in the most radioactive school in the world, where there's the highest background radiation ever measured on Earth. Now, I measured 100 microsieverts per hour in the playground of that school, just a little higher on the top left there on that photo with my Geiger counter. Now, I can't even imagine what the French authorities would do if we had that in French school. But in this case, the school operated for several decades. So I thought that was interesting and I suggested to make a scientific study of the high health of the students that attended that school. So the study was done a few years later and finally published in an environmental journal called Isotopes in Environmental and Health Studies in October 2013. And the result of that study is that the students who attended that school since the 1970s and their offspring, their descendants, their children, because they now many of them are adult and have children, there are no negative health effects has been observed on that population compared to a standard population living in the same um, province of Iran. And uh, so it's interesting to see that even at a fairly high amounts of radiation, there are still no um, negative health effects. The negative health effects, of course, appear, but at even higher doses, about 10 to 100 times higher, which means the type of radiation you would meet inside a nuclear reactor in operation, so that's much higher or on the day of uh, the explosion of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, of course, these are deadly levels of radiation, but they're much higher than these, which are already a thousand times higher than the ones that uh, the normal natural background. So we're still in the useful zone in that area. So we can see that even if we go uh, 10 times more, 100 times more, even a thousand times more, it's still not deadly and dangerous. It becomes when you go above those levels. Next. Now the health, the beneficial health effects of radiation is, can be the subject of another entire presentation of several hours. Uh, there's a lot of myths and misunderstandings on that subject. Here you can see the energy dependence rate of France starting in the 1960s. So as um, in the early 1960s, when my father started searching for oil in 1960, when he, his first job, he was uh, hired by SNPA. The company name was Société Nationale des Pétroles d'Aquitaine. That's the time where France was almost independent with the oil production. 
Uh, it was in southwestern France in the region called Aquitaine. But uh, when he was hired in 1959, 1960, he immediately was um, uh, asked to go to Gabon because it was clear with the uh, post-war and economic development that the oil in France was not enough anymore. And so we had to go and get oil in Africa. So that's the reason my, my first three years were in Gabon, in the jungle. My father's mission was to get that oil out of the ground in Gabon. So he, there was a few helicopters uh, every week which uh, would bring whatever was needed. And his mission was to get the oil out of the ground. And, but rapidly this was not enough. So we had to, um, every occidental country had to go to the Middle East and increase the production until the first oil shock, 1973. And then brutally France understood that we could just be deprived from oil and that it would be the end of our civilization. So it was this brutal start of the French nuclear program in 1973. The technology was ready, but it was not deployed. So we can see on this chart that it took about 25 years to complete the program. The last reactor there, the, we have 58 nuclear reactors in France. And the last reactor was put into uh, production in 1999. So it, took, it takes about a quarter of a century to, even if you go on a crash program and you decide it's very urgent, it's top national priority, it takes over 20 years to build the program and have it, have it be efficient. But you can see the result is that the energy independence of France is, is it goes uh, back up and uh, makes you, gets you free of um, dependence. Now today, France is very dependent from the, like the whole of Europe, from the import of gas coming from basically Russia and the Middle East. But more and more is coming from Russia. And uh, today, Putin decided to increase the costs. So he just uh, slows the flow of oil, doesn't deliver a, a gas, uh, uh, doesn't give us as much as he used to, and the price immediately doubles, triples, quadruples. Now, you can ruin a country like that. And so it's not a basically a very comfortable solution. So nuclear energy is very good also for energy independence because basically every country who runs on nuclear power is absolutely independent. There's uranium everywhere. France has been independent with the uranium production basically until 10 years from now. And the reason we closed most of our uranium mines in France is not because they're empty, it's just because new mines have been found in Australia or in Canada or in Kazakhstan, which are much cheaper to operate. But if you increase the, the price that you're ready to pay uranium, it changes nothing to the price of the electricity that you're producing because uranium is only five to 10% maximum of the price of the kilowatt hour. So basically uh, nuclear power is not sensitive to the price and the availability of uranium because there's uranium everywhere. And because the fraction of the price that comes from uranium in the total cost of the kilowatt hour is very, very small, just a few percent. So even if the price would double, tri triple, quadruple, uh, basically it does not affect very much the price of electricity to the consumer. Next. You can notice that when the Greens entered the French government in 1997, they decided to stop the Super Phoenix nuclear power plant. Then uh, with François Hollande and uh, Macron, they decided to stop the Fessenheim nuclear power plants. And now the French uh, emissions are going up again because we're not building new reactors and we're closing some of those we have. So this is a major ecological mistake. It's an error of historic proportions, in fact. You can also see that we have a country that can be compared to France, it's Italy. Until 1973, Italy and France were in very similar situations. There were very good nuclear scientists in Italy and in France, like we had Marie Curie, but Italy had Enrico Fermi, for example, who was a very good nuclear scientist. But Italy made a contrary political decision. They decided first to build the nuclear reactors. They built a few, but they never started them for political reasons. They just decided to stop it in the middle of the program for no reason, just polit politics, bad politics. And so the energy dependence of Italy continued to rise and now they're over 90% dependent on the Middle East and Russia. And the cost of electricity in Italy is about double the price that it is in France. So of course the French industry is also a lot stronger than the Italian industry. Next. This is about the reserves of uranium. 
So uranium today is about like the oil in the 1920s when it was being discovered that there are large amounts of oil in Texas in the United States. Uh, the more you search for uranium, the more you find it. I mean, you can find lots of it everywhere. A few years ago, it was thought that we had perhaps like 50 years of uranium in stock. But after a few years passed, it, it appeared that uh, there's more than we expected. And there's a, uh, a yellow book that's uh, published by the um, Nuclear Energy Agency, which is a branch of the United Nations. Um, uh, which is, so the yellow book is published every couple of years. And each time they publish a new edition, they publish the new edition, it, it, the reserves, the uranium reserves go up instead of going down. Logically, we're consuming uranium, so the reserves should be going down. But what's happening is that the more years go by, the more uranium we're discovering. And the discoveries are still greater today than the consumption. So the uranium resources available are still increasing. That was the case for oil until the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. It's not the case anymore because you were burning the known resources and we're not finding any new major oil resources now. Everything to be discovered has more or less been discovered. But for uranium, we're still in the early phase. So if you look at oil and gas, we have enough for about 50 years, maybe 100 years. If you go into fracking, a lot of fracking, which is also not very environmentally friendly. Uh, there's also huge amounts of coal, but that's the worst polluter. And when you go into uranium, there is about over a century of uh, uranium. If you go into the um, uh, uh, phosphate resources, for example, in Morocco, then there's a lot more. It turns into several centuries. And then if you go into the unproven resources and what's yet to be discovered, it's even more. Now that's with today's reactors. But if you go into reprocessing like France, it's with today's reactors. And today's reprocessing technology, which many countries in, like the United States are not reprocessing their used fuel yet. They probably will in the future, but for the moment, they're not doing it. Now, again, in this area, France is showing the way to go, which means reprocess the uranium, recover 96% plus the 1% plutonium, which is precious fuel. Now, if you go into reprocessing and new technologies of reactors, like the fast neutron reactors, then it's, you're not speaking about hundreds of years, you're speaking about tens of millenniums of resources. So there is absolutely no uh, limitation by the uranium or thorium resources. In case we'd be limited by uranium, there's three times more thorium available than there is uranium. And India has shown that it's possible, although very difficult, it's possible to operate uh, nuclear reactors working on thorium. It's, it's more expensive, it's more dangerous for the workers inside the plants because there's more irradiation for the workers, but it's technically possible and these reactors can certainly be improved. But in any case, we won't be short of uranium for millenniums. So there's nothing to worry about. And uh, the responsibility of our generation is to make the shift from oil, gas, and coal, which are the big problems, to clean uranium. And once we've done that, our generation has done the work uh, that's under our responsibility. Make sure we develop clean reactors and we, we just uh, manage the waste in a proper manner, which is the case in modern countries today, like the United States, Sweden, and France. So just imitate these models and it's done properly. And then the next generations, uh, the next hundreds of generations, will have lots of time, plenty of time to prepare for whenever there's not enough uranium, develop the new thorium reactors and so on. Next. Of course, there are risks and accidents. I'll go a bit fast on that section because it could speak of. Yeah, can it. I ask you how many slides is to finish? Only uh, maybe we, we've done more than three quarters. Okay. Uh, because it's better faster, to, to speak I'll a little, no? Next, I'll go faster because this is section is, first, it's a bit negative. It's not about the benefits of nuclear power, okay. it's about the risk just to show that the risks do exist, but in fact, they're very small and well dealt with. Next. Uh, all energies are dangerous, even windmills. And when you look at the number of deaths, well, windmills kill more than nuclear power per amount of energy produced. Windmills fall, if they fall down, they burn, uh, they're dangerous. Hydro, hydro dams can burst. This was in, on top left, an example in France, 1959. There's been an example in uh, India where 
uh, dam killed, uh, dam burst killed 30,000 people. That was in uh, Morvi, dam burst uh, in 1979. Next. So every energy is dangerous, but nuclear is probably the safest. A few words about the Chernobyl accident. It was, first of all, it, it was easy to avoid, but they did every mistake that should not be done. The reactor was um, unstable, unsafe by construction. It was uh, without a confinement. Uh, and on the day the accident happened, they were making a forbidden experiment to see how things operate when you shut down the reactor and operate on the electricity provided by the turbine only. And this, uh, this procedure was strictly forbidden on that reactor. So some engineers uh, refused to do the test and they were just asked to, asked to shut their mouth and uh, provided other engineers to do the test. So they saw the result. They were doing a dangerous experiment on a dangerous reactor with no containment. So when you do that, well, the radiation ends out into the atmosphere. Major mistakes were uh, done. And although these were major mistakes and the reactor melted and everything went wrong, in fact, it's the worst accident you can have on a nuclear power plant. Um, more than half of the radioactive content of the core was thrown out into the atmosphere by the fire, which burned for several weeks after the meltdown. And uh, it went directly into the atmosphere because there was no containment. Uh, but even though all this was done in every wrong possible manner, it still killed only a few dozen of the workers who uh, worked on the rescue operations. Uh, when you hear about millions of deaths or thousands of deaths, they're not real deaths, they're hypothetical deaths, which are uh, calculated by anti-nuclear organizations, to put it simple. Smoking kills six million people per year, that's a lot more. That's a real public health issue. It's one Chernobyl every five minutes. At Three Mile Island, you have the typical accident that you can get on a Western nuclear power plant. That was in 1979 in the United States. The reactor uh, melted. Uh, the operators didn't understand properly the situation, so they pressed on all the wrong buttons and made the problem even worse and melted the reactor. Uh, worse. But because there's, there was a containment, a thick concrete containment around the reactor, like there is around every of the French and European reactors, uh, nothing went outside. So it was a hysteria in the media. It was a great journalistic and political uh, fear. But in fact, no one died or even was injured from radiation. So that's the typical accident you can get on a modern nuclear reactor. Next, Fukushima is a different story. That was the Nodor reactor, which, had, which did have a containment, but it was not a one meter thick reinforced concrete containment. It was just a 10 to 20 centimeter thick uh, steel containment. So it was a sort of first generation uh, containment. Um, the containment did succeed in containing the radiation in the first four days. The accident happened on a Friday and the radiation was completely contained at Fukushima until the Tuesday morning. On the Tuesday morning, the containment started, um, uh, there was a crack in the containment, so the radiation started going out. But in the meanwhile, they had evacuated 20 kilometer radius around the reactor. So this is why there are no civilian casualties in Fukushima and there could not be any because when the radiation levels increased in the environment, the radiation, the population was, was already evacuated. So the only risks and dangers were for the uh, emergency workers on site. And it was better managed than it was in Chernobyl because in Japan, they had the radiation counters. Uh, they were more careful with the safety operations. And so no one died, even in the workers, uh, although it was a very difficult situation for them, of course, um, because they, they lost, they didn't even have a power at all. Uh, when basically when a nuclear accident happens in these sorts of reactors, all you have to do is keep the reactor cool, cool it down. And to cool it down, you need to have water, a pump and electricity, three things necessary. In the case of uh, a Fukushima accident, they had, um, no pump, 
and no electricity. They had the seawater, um, but they weren't allowed, for, according to the rules, to use the seawater for cooling the reactor. But the uh, boss of the Fukushima plant decided to go against the Japanese rules and use the seawater, although it was forbidden to keep the reactor cool and avoid the meltdown. He was right in doing that. It was sort of improvised, and he's a very competent and a big hero because in Japan they're not used to disobey to orders. But he did disobey and use the seawater to keep the reactor cool. He was right to do it. Probably saved lives. So all the reactors stopped. No one died from radiation and ever will die. Uh, only a few workers, a handful of workers, were uh, irradiated slightly above the authorized levels, but not above the levels of the Mr. Tareshi, which I showed you on one of the previous slides. So they all survived and no one died from radiation from Fukushima. Now, of course, large lessons have been learned both from Chernobyl and Fukushima. The nuclear reactors, even in operation, have been retrofitted and improved. The, the procedures have been improved. And in France, we have, and in every nuclear country, there's a post-Fukushima rules, which uh, apply to the reactors now. And so nuclear is even safer since these accidents have occurred. The reactors are already very safe, but they've been made even safer. Next. Just a few words, uh, a terror attack against the nuclear power plants is very difficult. It's very difficult because first nuclear power plant, as you can see on the picture, the scale is respected. There's the scale of the World Trade Center tower. And you can see the size of a nuclear reactor compared to the size of the World Trade Center tower. It's very difficult for an amateur pilot to aim at the reactor building. In addition to the fact that it's very small, there's lots of secondary buildings around it which, which probably the highest probability is the plane wouldn't even attain. It wouldn't even reach the reactor building. Then the reactor building is, is, uh, round, is round shaped. And so the plane would simply bounce off the reactor building. And it's uh, one meter thick of reactor concrete, very thick reinforced concrete. And uh, in the case of the EPR reactor, it's twice. There's two containments of one meter thick each, one uh, like a Pouperus one around each, one after each other. So there's two successive containments to be breached. So that's impossible. An airplane is very light structure, only weighs a few dozens or hundreds of tons at most. And so it will simply smash like a marshmallow against the reactor building and not damage anything. In addition to the fact that it's very difficult to do. In fact, if an airplane crashes on any building, I'd like to be inside the nuclear containment rather than inside the World Trade Center tower. Next. Next. When you do all the calculations with how many people died over the years, over in back, um, nuclear power, in fact, is the safest of all technologies, even safer than solar and wind. Next. So there are different types of nuclear reactors. So just a few words about that because there's a lot of talking about it these days. So the reactors installed and producing the electricity today are the big reactors like the EPR, the AP1000, the new American model, the advanced Kandu reactor, ACR, Canadian model, the advanced boiling water reactor that the Japanese are building. So in, in all these reactors, we're producing large amounts of electricity. There's also a number of new designs that are smaller reactors that are being developed and built. Um, with These can have benefits. Uh, for example, they can be made even safer because they are very small. There's no way they can melt, even if everything goes wrong. There's not enough heat to get the reactor to melt down. So it's what you call being intrinsically safe. Now this has a big benefit because if it's intrinsically safe, then you can put them near, near the cities or even inside the cities like the plans were in France for the Grenoble reactor in the 1970s. And uh, uh, the worst case scenario is not really dangerous. And so there are a number of uh, small reactors being developed like Terra Power in the United States, like. Uh, the Flex Blue project in France, which has now been replaced by the new uh, reactor called New Ward, which is a small pressurized water reactor. Uh, the Russians have uh, uh, 
uh, have completely finished building their floating barge, which they can take to wherever the electricity is needed, just float it to an, any country in the world, provide the electricity. And then when the, you change the fuel, just ship the fuel back to the Russia. And the, um, uh, for example, a developing country doesn't need to have all the nuclear infrastructure. That the providing country, which can be Russia or France or the United States, can provide the full service like, uh, like you do with uh, oil production barges. Uh, you just provide the, the barge, you provide the servicing, you provide the personnel, bring the personnel by helicopter or airplane if necessary. And so nothing is dependent on what happens in, in the hosting country, which just gets the electricity. So you can just sell the electricity out with a total service and buy per kilowatt hour basis. So these are sort of new concepts being developed right now. And then there's the generation four reactors, which we, will be the even better reactors for the future. Basically, these will be operated on, on natural uranium or on uranium-238, where in today's reactors are mostly operating on uranium-235 that needs to be enriched. So these new generation four reactors can uh, also burn plutonium and burn much of the nuclear waste. Basically, with uh, one kilo of natural uranium, you can produce up to 100 times more electricity than you do today with our current reactors. So these are gen reactors for the future. Uh, for example, the Super Phoenix reactor in France was a 1300 megawatt, which means industrial size. 1300 is amongst, among the biggest reactors in the world, in fact. And that reactor was operating in the early 1980s before it was unfortunately stopped politically stopped in 1997 when the Greens entered the French government. It was their condition for participating to the socialist government. Very stupid politics, all that. Uh, condition was you stop Super Phoenix, otherwise we won't get you elected. So they got elected and they stopped Super Phoenix. But um, France has demonstrated that even the generation four reactors can be operated at an industrial scale. Next. Now we're coming to the last part of the presentation. Just a few words about EFN, Environmentalist for Nuclear Energy. It's a non-governmental organization which I created in 1996. And our mission is to inform the public, the politicians and the journalists about the many benefits of nuclear energy for uh, electricity production and for health. Uh, it's been growing rapidly since 1996. Now we have members and supporters in 16,000 members and supporters today in 65 countries on five continents. Next. Uh, we have a website in 15 languages. It's called ecolo.org. Uh, so you're welcome to visit and you have uh, information in many different languages. Now that's our old website. Now we have a new website in development. The address is also ecolo.org, but you replace the www by wp.ecolo.org. And um, that's our new, it's a new technology website. It's automatically translated into 120 languages. And we're looking forward to having a similar uh, system maybe with our newsletter that can be distributed in 120 languages as well. So we're sort of modernizing our system. Uh, we have unfortunately very small budget, so it takes time. Um, and our operations rely mostly on volunteer people. In fact, you need only on volunteer people. We have no paid staff. Even myself as founder and president of the organization, I make absolutely no money out of this. Uh, so I want to be precise because people imagine I must, I must be very rich and paid by the industry. Unfortunately, it's absolutely not the case. Uh, the industry is under political control and the Greens uh, are in alliance with the French government. And uh, this is the case in most of Europe. So unfortunately, we're the, one of the biggest pro-nuclear organizations in the world, but we have the smallest budget you can imagine for any not-for-profit organization in the world, which is close to zero. So you're welcome to come and join. We're a happy group. and. Uh, you can join on the internet, just uh, click on the subscribe button. This is a, oh, you can, yeah. This is my book, the title in English is Environmentalist for Nuclear Energy. It's been published in about 12 languages over the years, Spanish, uh, Russian, Chinese, Japanese, uh, German. No, German, not yet. I need, I need help for the German. Uh, I don't speak any German. 
and our finance are very low at the moment. Uh, but um, Romanian, uh, Spanish, well, different languages. And so basically the same content that I'm giving in this presentation is also, but in different wording in the book, Environmental History for Nuclear Energy. Next, what's interesting in the book is the preface by Professor Lovrock, uh, who's become a good friend. Now I contacted Professor Lovrock about 22 years ago to ask him to write a preface for my book. Lovgok is the author of the Gaia theory. He's a big scientist and a very good chemist in the beginning. He's the inventor of the electron capture detector, which is uh, uh, at the core of a spectrum, what you call spectrometry, which is something that every good laboratory in the world does. And you can detect very small amounts of material, like just a few molecules, thanks to spectrometry. So he's the guy who invented the electron capture detector that makes possible. It's with this detector, for example, that the presence of DDT was measured in the ice of the North Pole in, at the end of the 1960s and 1970s. So he became a big hero in the environmental world as the author of the Gaia theory and because of his scientific work. And uh, he had become sort of forgotten at the 1980s and 1990s when I contacted him asking if he could write an introduction for my book in the English edition. And he gladly accepted, so we became friends and wrote a good introduction where he says, for example, that's just a short quote, the dangers of continuing to burn fossil fuels as our main energy source threatens not just individuals, but civilization itself. I hope it's not too late for the world to emulate France and make nuclear energy our main energy source. Um, and he became a, a, a hero again. He was reborn because the, the magazine, The Independent in the UK published uh, the introduction he made to my book. And so it was his sort of second life as an author and lecturer. He became invited everywhere and went around the planet for a second time in his late years. Now he's still alive, but very, very old, not very, uh, not traveling as much as he used to. Among the other uh, well-known environmentalists, we have uh, Bishop Hugh Montefiore, who used to be a friend but passed away a few years ago. He was the co-founder of uh, Friends of the Earth in the UK. Um, on the top, you can see my good friend Patrick Moore. I also already mentioned a few words. So he was a, he's a Canadian guy, lives on, in Vancouver and on the island of Vancouver. It's very good. He, he, for example, he developed the first sal organic salmon farms in Canada and the organic salmon production technology. He also worked for developing heat pumps. And uh, of course, he's very well known as the founder of Greenpeace in 1971 in Canada, a very first uh, founder, not only of Greenpeace Canada, but for Greenpeace International. He was also, for example, on the uh, the Rainbow Warrior on the day the ship was sunk by the French secret services. He was on the boat that very day. Uh, he was also, for example, he flew with a helicopter with Brigitte Bardot on the North Pole uh, with baby seals when the day Brigitte Bardot took the baby seals in her arms and that was on the cover of Paris Match and then all over the world and throughout Europe and the world and ended up with uh, um, uh, forbidding uh, killing the baby seals, protecting the baby seals. So he's the guy that's behind all this. So now, of course, when become, because he's done his coming out pro-nuclear, uh, all the anti-nuclear environmentalists say he's a traitor to the cause. But in fact, he's a real founder of environmental thinking, just as uh, uh, James Lovelock is considered as the historical founder of all the environmental thinking, even before Patrick Moore. So you can see that uh, very famous and competent environmentalists around the world are now in the new trend of defending nuclear power and proposing this as the main energy source for the future. It's not only the main energy source, in fact, it's the only solution we have that works. So we have no choice. Uh, it's it's uh, die or disappear or go back to the Middle Ages and, and have a large portion of the humanity die away or, or go nuclear. And I think we should go nuclear because it's, it's safe, because it's clean, because it's abundant and it solves the need. Next. 
Uh, we have only one planet, it's small, it's fragile, the resources are limited, and we have uh, something that's abundant, cheap, and works. So let's go for it. Next. Next. So as a conclusion, I would just like to say that first, we have a major energy crisis coming up down the road, right, in, starting right now. Um, it's a major energy crisis and that the key to our future and our survival is a clean and safe energy supply for all the inhabitants of the planet. The world needs more energy and more clean energy. And the only one we have that fits the need is nuclear power. So EFN, I, I as a person and EFN as a group is proud of playing an active role in this movement of awakening the consciousness of, of, the, of humanity. And we welcome all those among you who are willing to join us. So you're welcome to join. You can join us and just free and become a supporter or you can pay some dues or do have a donation and then you become a, a member of the organization. You can also be a local correspondent and organize some activities in your country, in your region, in your state, in your city, in your company or with your neighbors or whatever you can do to help will be much welcome. We welcome everybody. Uh, we are not a political group. Uh, we have people from the right and from the left. We have, uh, we're not um, politically oriented. We're not gender oriented. We take straight people and homosexuals, gay, lesbians, and cross gender and whatever you want. Um, we take women and uh, people of all ages. And so we welcome absolutely everybody. Our goal is just to make everybody on the planet happier and give, offer a better life. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. I have finished with this presentation and open to questions. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I put here the contact of, uh, yes, we put the, the city web, Ecolo, the book and uh, yes, and the contact. Okay, and yes, you are kindly invited to the visit the Echo House. He's going to organize an international uh, at Christmas. You're welcome. You're welcome to come for Christmas. Christmas, yes. Christmas. <laughs> okay, stop recording here and uh...